Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, it's a bit late here. I'm busting my ass to try and get this video done on time because I don't want to miss a week. Um, this one's a big one. It took a bit longer than the others. Uh, a lot more work went into it because we did the full illustration of the goblin, uh, the full scene, and it brought up a lot of interesting topics. So I'm just super excited to, to move on with some new projects after this. I've got so many ideas. But um, yeah, for now, uh, sit down, enjoy the show. We're going to get in and finish the Goblin series. So I'll see you in Photoshop. All right, here we are with the final Goblin. And this one is going to get the full treatment. It's going to be put into a nice scene. Um, and we're going to take it to a final, which is pretty exciting. We've done a bunch of design work coming up to this, sketching, you know, tight line drawing, rendering and now this one uh, we're gonna we're gonna do the whole thing uh, so what I'm doing here is just trying to trying to draw in the scene uh, probably getting a little bit too detailed here usually I would start something like this with small thumbnails so this is a bit out of my comfort zone I think trying to draw a, an environment around a character um, that's not an approach I would recommend uh, <laughs> didn't have a choice here because the character was already drawn um, but if you're doing this from scratch, do a bunch of thumbnails first. Try and figure out how the shapes relate to one another before you start um, and design the characters and things within that scene to suit the shapes that you want within your composition. That's super important. But alas, I have not done that with this image and the result is that the environment shapes are too complicated. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a thing going on here where... Uh, I've got a very detailed line art there and so my brain wants to match that level of detail and it's making my judgment want to add more detail to the shapes that I'm putting in so I probably should have started with some small thumbnails even though I have the character drawn already I probably should have got my pad out and just started trying to see how those shapes would relate to one another but uh, in the end it, it it is following like a, a golden spiral type of uh, composition. You can see starting from the bottom left and going up around those trees and sort of you can see a spiral that, that, that heads towards the, the face of the goblin, the focal point, which at the moment doesn't look very high contrast. Uh, but the idea was to have the goblin standing in front of um, the rock in the background and in the light. There I just dropped the, the light into the scene to show how it would pop out. Uh, it didn't really end up that way I don't think uh, uh, because well goblins are green and forests are green and <laughs> that's the kind of thing that should be solved I guess during the uh, thumbnailing process doing little color tests and things like that to make sure that you're onto a good idea so you don't have to improvise later but um, I, I did have to improvise later because I just jumped into it uh, an all too often told story <laughs> Uh, but th the result was good in the end. I, I was happy with it and it was a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, here I am just sort of trying to find the, the relationships between the shapes. And I decided to change the composition just a little bit, just alter the crop, um, just to give a little bit more space because it was feeling a bit cramped. And I, I don't think I did end up solving that problem. <laughs> I think, I think the problem would have been solved, um, by doing a little bit more work up front. Now we're moving into the process of filling in the local local color. Um, and I'm doing this in the, exactly the same way that we did it with the individual characters. Um, I'm going to do the same thing with the environment as well. And we'll get all of the elements into the image with their local color. Um, and then we can change them. And it's really easy to do that if you've painted in all of those local colors on their own individual layers. Because you just have to select the layer that you want to change the color of, and then just press Control H, and it will bring up the hue and saturation slider. Um, grab the hue bar and just move it up and down. Um, it will change the color and assess how it matches the colors around it. Try and look for something that's harmonious um, and, and a good starting point. Now, at this stage, obviously, everything's going to look really flat, and that's fine. You're looking for a good base to work from. So everything's kind of washed out uh, and plain uh, because we don't 
have any separation of light and dark yet. But when we start to add that in, we begin to exaggerate the colors a little bit uh, and we begin to play with temperature. It's a good idea when you are coloring your image to vary the temperature of the colors. And color temperature is a really difficult concept to describe. It's kind of a thing you you feel like the reds are really warm and the blues are really cold. Um, and anywhere in between, you've got warm greens and cold greens. And often to get a better sense of volume with something, if you want to if you want things to look nice and round, um, it's good to have a cold side and a warm side. Uh, it's really hard to explain. <laughs> oh man, as I'm doing these videos, I'm just, uh, I gotta put a little counter on for every time I say, I'm gonna do an, an individual video on this topic. <laughs> the number of topics that come up when you start to talk about this stuff is crazy. It's a really complicated thing to do and it just gets me excited. <laughs> Anyway, um, you may have noticed there was a bit of a jump in the video there. Um, yeah, my computer actually crashed at that point. I've been having a few problems with it. And I'm actually on a new machine now while I'm recording the audio. Uh, so hopefully that stuff doesn't happen in the future and you don't lose any video. All that you missed was um, me balancing out the colors that I put on. So I put down those local colors and then I tried to make them look like they related to one another. And this sort of feeling a little bit more harmonious and, and when you start to get to that point the next step is to begin dividing things into areas that are receiving light and those that are not receiving light. Now this bit is exactly the same as how we handled the character so um, that's what makes me think that whenever people say I can't draw backgrounds or I'm having you know I, I don't do environments I, I can only draw characters and things like that um, that's why I think that they're missing this environment lighting, like the bounce light, because it should all be handled the same uh, as a character. It's actually simpler because it's an abstract shape. You don't have to worry about any anatomy or anything like that. Um, so with your environments, handle them in exactly the same way, but make sure the color relationships are correct and that they inform one another. The character and the environment are part of the same scene. So they mustn't be treated separately. Um, I've actually seen some videos of people who have more beginner work uh, and they will render up a character on a white background and then try and paint in um, a scene around it. And it always looks so jarring. It never works because the environment and the character are part of the same scene. They need to be developed together. It's important that the colors are not simply thought of as crayons that you're coloring in uh, a, a coloring book with you should never think oh grass grass is green and grab the green crayon and just start drawing because depending upon what colors surround the grass that might not be green at all grass may not be green in that situation it may be blue or it could be yellow now it may be true that the local color of the grass will always be green but if you have a big, I don't know, a big orange wall next to the grass, uh, then light's going to bounce off that orange wall and go onto the grass, which is local color green, receiving orange light. So you need to take the average color between the local green and this new light that is being reflected onto it. And that is how you develop a color relationship. Now, it is super important to understand one thing. If, if, if you struggle with tying characters and environments together, just remember this one thing. There really is no such thing as a color. That does not exist. And get that in your head. Because it's very important to understand that the only thing that exists are color relationships. Okay? One color next to another color will influence one another. They always will. You can, you can see examples of this. Um, James Gurney does some really great stuff in uh, Color and Light, a book I highly recommend that you go and pick up. Um, I read it 
five years ago or something when I was starting uh, down the art path and I thought I'd absorbed everything and moved on and then a couple of years later I read it again <laughs> and it blew my mind all of this stuff because as you, as you learn more um, you begin to become more receptive to more information that you may have not quite understood the first time um, you hear it and I'm just the other day I just picked it up again and started reading again and it's blowing my mind again uh, so much insight the guy is just he's the scientist of the art world he really tests things and he does a bunch of tests putting different colors next to one another in different lighting situations um, I'll bring one up on the screen now um, it's a famous sort of trick uh, an optical illusion um, and those squares are the same color <laughs> they're the same but the color relationships are different right because one is receiving one color light one is receiving a different color light and if you are adding a character into like in an environment scene this is happening to all of your colors at the same time okay understand that the lights within the scene are coloring everything if you've got a predominantly blue scene and you want to show some sort of yellowish orangey sort of colors just you can put a gray into a predominantly monochromatic blue scene and it will look like it's complementary color it will look like the opposite color that the the image is predominantly and i shit you not this stuff is a it's a mind bender it's it's hard <laughs> it's really hard to get your head around um but you start to slowly, slowly figure it out. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any easy way to sort of practice and understand other than experimentation, to be honest. Um, but if you think of it in a way, the way that I have kind of begun to imagine it um, is that I, I think, what is the dominant color in my scene? And then for anything that is that I want to have in the scene that is the opposite, the complementary color to to that um, predominant color. I'm going to knock that saturation saturation right back, um, mostly unless it's a focal point, and I want there to be a lot of um, a lot of interest there. Because if you use complementary colors next to each other in equal vibrancy and, and saturation, they will they will blow your eye sockets out. They they buzz. They vibrate off the page. It's an effect that I wouldn't recommend unless you are trying to get that effect. <laughs> uh, don't willy-nilly put green and red right next to each other, super saturated. Because every time you do, you are creating a strong focal point. And if that's not your intention, uh, you might have to reevaluate what your red is. It might have to become a little bit more blue and a little bit less saturated. That would be my, um, my guess. Um, but yeah, just experiment, play with it, you know, um, so much about art is experimenting, you know, I might be saying, don't put strong red and green next to one another. Maybe you want to, maybe that's your style. I mean, I know I'm guilty of it. I've do, I do it all the time. <laughs> uh, I like to think that I know why I'm doing it, <laughs> uh, but then, you know, sometimes, sometimes I just feel like I don't know what I'm doing and I make a bunch of mistakes and have to fix it. <laughs> Actually, I was, I was talking to a friend the other day and uh, came to the conclusion that uh, painting, especially in the beginning, is the art of doing a crap drawing and then spending 30 or 40 hours trying to fix it. <laughs> and there are certainly some artists out there who don't do that. I think they're the exception. <laughs> uh, one, one person that springs to mind is a personal favorite of mine, Rob Ray. Uh, go and have a look at his work. He does these beautiful science um, space images of uh, like women and cats and things like that and personified sort of celestial objects and uh, really, really beautiful stuff, beautiful stuff. Uh, and I've watched a couple of process videos of him working. He, he has a different philosophy. Like it's a, you know, do a beautiful drawing and then put exactly the right color down in exactly the right place the first time and never make a mistake. But... <laughs> you know, the rest of us are human. But having said that, I think, I think if I was to ask Rob Ray um, how he manages to do that, he would just say that he experimented and failed. 
uh, for a couple of decades or something, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't think there's ever going to be a way to get around the fact that if something is difficult, if you have trouble putting characters into scenes, you just need to do it a whole bunch more. So try and have fun with it. I think that's the important thing. Like, this isn't a chore, right? <laughs> um, if you're sitting around drawing a goblin, you should be having a good time. <laughs> I know I am. And it can be frustrating, right? But if you put your, if you just, I don't know, check your ego at the door and understand that um, you're going to fail a lot, you should be able to just have fun with it. Um, yeah, I actually got a message from someone on my on my YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago, uh, Reginald Scully, and he was talking about Art Block. And I think um, the next video uh, is going to be a little conversational one. I might have a sketch going on in the background or something, but I am going to talk about Art Block, overcoming Art Block, and sort of trying to put yourself into a like a mental state of mind to, to get the work done. And it's such a huge and varied subject because everybody is going to have their own personal reasons for feeling art block. So I'm going to put in a bit of time in a different way. I'll, I'll have a little sketch going on in the background of the video, but I'm going to prepare the topic because, you know, with this previous series, I have just been basically ad-libbing into a microphone <laughs> talking about whatever comes to mind as I'm watching the video unfold. Uh, but I want to put a little bit more work into this because I think it's an important topic. Um, it's the thing that stops the most people from achieving their art goals is just hitting a wall at some point and quitting. So I'm going to try and throw my two cents in the ring and hopefully if it just helps one or two people uh, keep going and, and realize a dream, um, that's awesome. Anyway, this um, this video is not really changing so much so I'll I'll fast forward it quite a bit here because this is just getting into the details I've I've got lighting direction and everything in the scene now the things are divided into light and shadow uh, there's a lot of detail to put in here and it would be a very long video if I just um, if I just let you watch it all um, you're probably getting bored hearing me talk about the same stuff over and over again so we'll skip a little bit to the end and aren't you glad you didn't have to watch me paint every single blade of grass. <laughs> um, I had a lot of fun with this one, guys. Um, I love this fey kind of fantasy, whimsical kind of feeling. Um, nice enchanted forests. Uh, that's the sort of subject matter I think I enjoy the most. Being a bit of a Dungeons and Dragons nerd, um, I've just always wanted to try and create those worlds, you know, the ones that you imagine in your mind. Um, that aren't tied to any kind of movies or video games or anything like that. Those things can be great to feed the imagination, but every single person is different and unique and individual. And uh, oh, it's just such a thrill to be able to have that imagination and, and finally learn the tools to bring it to life and show it to other people. You know, this came from my imagination directly and you sort of show it to someone you can show them a world that you thought up it's just man art's cool <laughs> there's nothing cooler <laughs> one last little tip here um, i'm doing final adjustments on the image now it's done um, all the relationships are pretty good it may be a little bit high contrast the shadows may be a bit dark but but nah, whatever we'll fix that in the next one um but yeah it's really a good idea at the very end to sort of play with a few gradients with strange layer modes and things like that. Uh, maybe do a, an overall color balance adjustment. Um, because what, what we were saying earlier about color relationships, you can, you can help to harmonize things because you're never going to get it absolutely perfect. But if you add just a little bit of blue, you know, increase the amount of blue in the image, then you're increasing the amount of blue in all of the colors. And that'll help tie it all together just that little bit more. Um, always a good idea to have a play around. Just tweak it ever so slightly. It really brings the piece together. Anyway, uh, this is done. Bing! There he is. Goblin series complete. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I, I definitely did. I, I had such a good time doing this. And I cannot wait to do more. Uh, I've got... 
so many ideas and, and things that I want to work on. But if you guys have any suggestions, comments, feedback, please let me know. I, I want to make this as good as possible. And I can't do that without your input because this is for you guys, you know. <laughs> what do you like about the videos? What do you want to see more of? Do you want more tutorial stuff? Do you want me to talk more about the idea generation stuff? Um, I'm happy to talk about art all day, every day. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, just, you know, if you have certain topics that you want to hear about, just let me know and I will talk for hours about them. <laughs> you know, half of it's probably nonsense, but uh, you never know. I might say something uh, wise every now and then. Woo! The goblins are done. <laughs> No more goblins for at least a couple of months. <laughs> Thank you so much for sticking around and uh, seeing this whole thing through to its completion. Uh, I can't wait to get stuck into some of the more topical episodes following this. I've got just so many ideas and I'm really enjoying making these videos. So hit me up with a comment, um, any sort of feedback that you want, uh, suggestions or just questions. Uh, I'd love to answer them and I'll get back to every single one. Um, what else? Oh yeah, got my Patreon, chuck a buck in if you want. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, next week, we're going to do a discussion on art block. Uh, so that one should be fun. Uh, it's a big topic. I'm going to try and take it from a slightly different angle. So I hope to see you there. See you next week, guys. Bye-bye.